Herzlich willkommen beim 36. DocFest München. Herzlich willkommen beim DocFest München at Home 2021. Mein Name ist Pablo Bücheler, ich bin Redakteur beim DocFest und hier ganz allein im Silbersaal des Deutschen Theaters. Das Deutsche Theater ist ja sonst der Ort, an dem wir unsere Reihe ganz großes Kino stattfinden lassen. Das ist auch der Ort, an dem wir uns eigentlich ganz viel Publikum erwarten. Es ist leider in diesem Jahr wieder nicht möglich, Publikum hier zu haben. Äh, nichtsdestotrotz freuen wir uns natürlich wahnsinnig, dass es uns auch dieses Jahr wieder gelungen ist, ganz viele besondere Filme in unserem Programm zu haben. Und einer von denen ist La Boceda von Luciana Caplan, eine Produktion aus Mexiko, die wir als Deutschlandpremiere im Doc Horizonte Wettbewerb laufen lassen. Und ich freue mich sehr, dass ich jetzt mit Luciana Caplan sprechen darf. Muy buenas tardes, Luciana Caplan. Buenas tardes. Buenos, buenos días todavía en México, buenas tardes en Europa. <laughs> in your film, you are portraying a woman called Marichui. Uh, she's the spokeswoman of the National Indigenous Congress and she wants to become the first indigenous Mexican candidate for presidency. When did you decide to make a film about her? Well, you know, in, in 2017, uh, for the first time, it was possible for, um, uh, for an independent candidate uh, to run for, for the presidency of, two, of 2018. And we heard that um, uh, the Zapatistas and the Indigenous Council were, they were thinking of launching a woman, an indigenous woman, to run for that independent candidacy. And we thought, Carolina Coppel, who's, who's the producer, and I, that it was like an historical event that for the first time an indigenous woman with that background coming from the Zapatistas, uh, people haven't heard uh, much about them since the rising in 94. They didn't know much about the indigenous council. And we thought it was going to be like an historical event, a very interesting process that of course like a lot of things were going to happen and we should uh, actually document that so even before we knew that Mary Chui was going to be the spokeswoman because we didn't we didn't know they didn't know because they had to vote first who who was going to be is of course this assembly uh, kind of organization so they they need to vote and and know who was going to be. So before that, we have a meeting with the Indigenous Council and, and, and we told them, you know, we want to make a film about this process. Uh, do you agree or not? Because of course, if we didn't have the access, it was impossible. So they say, yes, you can film everything that is public. You can do it. Every, everybody can do it. All the more private things, we don't know. We will see, we say, okay, it's a yes. And then we will win, you know, <laughs> some, some space in the meantime, and, and we will get there, and that's what happened. So we start filming the first time that we filmed, it was when she was actually announced like the spokeswoman. Mari Chui was going to be the spokeswoman, so we were there in Chiapas, and it was very exciting. You can see that in the film. That was the first time that we actually uh, filmed. You already mentioned it now, that uh, the National Indigenous Congress is somehow very connected to uh, the new, new Zapatista movement in Mexico. Uh, to be honest, it's not so common uh, knowledge here in Germany. Could you explain briefly how yes. this movement um, is created or um, what's behind this movement? Well, uh, I think that after, uh, well, in 94, there was a, this important rising in Chiapas only of the Zapatista movement uh, directed by the by the indigenous people in Chiapas, but with uh, Subcomandante Marcos that I think is very well known in the planet. <laughs> I don't know if many people know about him, but he's, he's a white man who actually organized all this rising because the situation of the, of the indigenous people in Chiapas was really terrible and they, and they really need to change things. So they rise. Uh, there was this kind of revolt and they end up uh, making some um, some agreements with the government, but in the end, the government ended up, you know, cheating them. And 
actually what they did is they, they went back to their, their communities, they organized, they make their own uh, communities, their own schools and everything, and they being kind of kept, kept quiet. They did some other activities, but they organized. So two years later, uh, because of that, because a lot of, of indigenous people start seeing that they need to have some kind of uh, organization and, and representation, they organize from all over the country, different indigenous group, because there are many, there are a lot of them, uh, to make this, uh, this council where they actually, what they do is to communicate, uh, they get together, they, they uh, launch it, um, some information about what is happening. They, uh, but it's basically an organized uh, group that they help each other. They, they, they listen to each other, but they arrive to a point where they see that if they don't do something uh, really big or that's kind of like strikes attention, um, uh, they were going to disappear because mm. the situation was really bad. So after like 25 years after they realized they need to launch this woman, not because they want to sit in the presidency chair, that's very important. They didn't want to get there. What they want is the spotlight again, so people can hear what's, what is happening. Yeah. What's, what's so remarkable for me seeing your film is the spokeswoman, uh, Mari Chui, she's such a quiet, such a calm person. Um, but the, her surroundings in uh, the Zapatista uh, communities is rather loud and the tone is military. Um, I wonder really how she got to this position, being such a quiet person. Well, I think that, uh, well, she's quiet, but she's very powerful. And she's not exactly, um, it's not like, like, like she is the candidate, the, uh, like the candidate, she's the spokeswoman. She's the one who talks through the voices of everybody. So, of course, she needs to be calm. And I think that's why they chose her, because she's, super, she's like a Zen master. After like a long time that I met her, and I've been with her, I really end up knowing her. And she's very bright, but she's very calm. You know, you can see where they, all these uh, news people are talking to her and she never loses her <laughs> spirit. So she, I think they need somebody like that, that she can actually obey as well because she needs to obey other people. She, it's not only her, that she wasn't going to take the microphone by herself and talk about her, but about everybody involved. And she has been with the movement for a long, long time. So I think they, at the beginning we say, that's very strange because she's not like a leader. She's, why is she going to be the spokeswoman? Is she's not, she's not so charismatic. She's not like this leader, but after a while we realized that it was because of that, because it was a wise woman that she's not going to take her by her side. She knows that it's for the good of all the indigenous group and, and the world. But um, I think that that's why they chose her, because they knew they, that they can trust her. You know, I think that's a, a very important. We had a guest. Um, I know that it's nearly impossible to get into uh, the Zapatista communities. It's for, for normal people, it's, it's forbidden to get there. You, we see this also in uh, on the letters uh, when, you, um, uh, when, the, um, when, when you pass by on uh, the street, you see like it's prohibited to, to get into uh, the communities. How did you manage to, to get there? And how was, was your feeling to be inside of this microcosmos and filming? Well, I think that it's, it's not like, like forbidden, but you need to ask for permission. You know, okay. a lot of people go, but you need some, some permission. And we were going with, with Marie Chui as, as any other media, because there was a lot of people from the media 
following uh, that process. Not all of them, of course, they, they just went in the beginning and then of course they forgot we went through all the, <laughs> uh, through all the campaign, but actually uh, all the media was, uh, was permitted to go. You need to uh, ask for access beforehand. You say, okay, we want to film there. We have a very close connection uh, with my Chu, with, with Indigenous Council, so we ask for permission every time we need to go to. We want to film her now in, at this place. Can we go? Yes, you can go. So uh, we always ask for that permission. But it was because of that, um, that tour that they were giving that we have, uh, and they have all the media, all this possibility to go inside the communities and film and everything, you know, it was, uh, they wanted that as well because it was, it was very important, very important for them to uh, make that uh, visible, you know, what, what was happening and that she was a candidate in a way, you know, mm. so, but it is hard to get there. I mean, if you don't ask for permission and they want to know why do you want to be there, why do you want to film, they, I mean, they knew us uh, from from before because, as I said, we were filming from a long time. So when when we arrived to the Zapatistas communities, by then we were already filming for for a while. We are following her steps on her campaign to be a candidate for presidency, and um, as she is getting more known in the country, she's also facing a lot of racist prejudices. Uh, in one scene, we see her reading racist messages she gets on social media, I guess. Um, how far is Mexico in a racist discourse on social level? How it's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. It's, it's, you know, it's an indigenous country. It's more like a mestizo country. It's a mix between uh, white and indigenous group. It's been uh, not like in in Bolivia or maybe Peru that they haven't mixed uh, so much, but it's an indigenous country, you know. And it's amazing how uh, there's still so much racism in every level, even in at the indigenous community. If you are a little bit more uh, bl uh, not so white, you get more <laughs> more attacked. That uh, the ones that are not so, uh, they're like a little bit wider. So it's a very racist, and there's a lot of uh, classist kind of issues. So it's something that we want to talk about as well with this film, you know, because it's really outrageous how in a country, as I said, that have such a big indigenous uh, people, and it's in. There was, of course, when the Spaniards came, there was a, a, a very big indigenous cultures and it's so bad seeing, it's like, you know, uh, you're like back up if you're uh, an indigenous, you're, you don't have rights, you are uh, not as good as if you're white. So that is, it seems to be like very hidden in most of the people, but you can see it all the time, you know, uh, of course, I'm white, for example, and it's something that is gives you power, that it gives you a lot more opportunities. If I go to ask for a job and the other person is, is not as light as, as I am, I'm, I think I'm gonna get the job. And that's the kind of thing that happens every day. You know, it seems to be kind of, of invisible. And even people say, no, we're not racist at all, but it's a very racist country, uh, maybe. <laughs> In Latin America, one of the racist one, besides Brazil, I think is that after that comes. Uh, we have uh, this year at Dogfest we have a focus section call, um, focusing on empowerment movements. Was it also important for you to show an act of empowerment in your film? Yes, yeah, I think more maybe. It's a call. It's a call for action. I think that people should uh, ask the planet because that's that's the message that the spokeswoman have. We have to do something with this planet, or we're going to we're going to disappear. It's not only for the 
for the indigenous group is that I think it's a global call, you know, so we cannot keep living the way we're living. And I think if, if that the indigenous communities have a lot to say about that because they're the, uh, the one who keeps the land, the water clean, uh, the territory safe. They're the safe keepers of, uh, of the planet. And those are the ones who are saying, you know, we really need to change the way we're living. And it's not only for the indigenous communities, it's for people that live in the cities, it's for everybody. So I think it's a call for action to say, look around, see what is happening. We really need to change, otherwise we're going to disappear. So uh, I will say that it's more about, about what is progress if, and I think she said very clearly, if, if progress is going to destroy, so is it progress or, you know, if progress destroys, it's not progress. So yeah. where are we going, all of us, you know? I won't tell here if Marichui uh, achieves her goal to get a presidency candidate, but we can talk about um, the future of the Zapatista communities. What, what do you think? Will there be a future, a good future, a hopeful future for um, those social structures you show us in the film? I think that more and more that people, what is happening, what they want is to become autonomous how the Zapatistas are, because the Zapatistas are autonomous, they live in their own communities without the people, uh, without the government money, they do their own funding, and I think that's a little bit the future of the, of the indigenous communities, and I think it's a very interesting way of rethinking the state, because I think the political parties and the state itself is in crisis, so we need to think in another way of organizations and I think what they're uh, creating that is more like a uh, communal uh, organi organization kind of a um, way of doing things uh, like smaller communities uh, becoming more close to the earth and really listening as an assembly not just one people deciding everything. I think that's the future of the, of the world, if, if you ask me. Of course, it's very complicated to think like that, but I think the, that most of the, of the indigenous communities are thinking about getting uh, their autonomy. And it's interesting now because the Zapatistas are traveling to Europe. I don't know if you know that, but they're going to make a tour through Europe to talk to people. And that's very interesting. They when? are going... They're living on a boat on the 3rd of May. They're going to make a big tour through Europe because they have a lot of connections, a lot of people that are supporting them. They're going to every country in Europe. But what they say is that we're not here to, to ask for your forgiveness or, for, or to say you have to, uh, to tell us that we're sorry because... Uh, because of the conquer of Mexico, we are here to talk to people, to say what makes us equal, what makes us the same. I think that's very interesting. It's a way, again, to put the spotlight uh, uh, and making uh, like, a sim like a symbol. They, they, they work a lot with symbols. It's like we are here to talk to the, to the planet about all the issues that makes us, uh, we have the same problems. Mm. And I think that's going to be very, very interesting. Of, of course, they're going to go to Germany, they're going to go to France, to... In Greece, they have like a lot of, of support. It's, uh, in Spain, in Italy. Uh, so that's going to be a very, very interesting tour. And then, and then they want to go like all over the planet. That's the, the idea, to travel and to talk to people, to connect. It's... Uh, so Fantastic. I think uh, that's the future of the Zapatista movement to say it's not only Mexico, we're all connected and we need to change this world. Yeah. Well, hopefully the pandemic won't cancel their plans because this really seems a very, very interesting project they are planning to. Thank you very, very much for this film, this important um, film you made. Um, um, I just have another question for your future as a filmmaker. Um, 
I know you already made one film about a politician called La Revolución de los Alcatraces. I think it's from 2013. Yes. Yeah. And it's also portraying a politician, as I mentioned. Um, will there be more films about politicians more. in the future? Or where is oh, your next I interest going to? Well, I always make films about like social or political issues. Well, my last film it was more like a philosophical one, but it's uh, what I'm making now is a new film about the uh, woman that cleans uh, public spaces, but it's more like a reflection on invisibility, how the these women that are cleaning the world are not being seen and they feel like invisible. So it's a uh, It's called invisibility treat, uh, an invisibility treaty. So it's more like a philosophical again. Uh, uh, but how how to make this like this woman to be visible because they're invisible and they clean you know the planet but nobody sees them. So I'm working. I'm already filming and I'm working on that. Nice. Well then, all the best for your plans and for uh, the next project. Um, hier auch nochmal allerwärmstens empfohlen, äh, La Vocera von Luciana Kaplan, zu sehen noch bis zum 23. Mai im Programm des Dogfest München. Und nicht vergessen, äh, dass es auch die Möglichkeit gibt, äh, für diesen Film beim BR Kino Kino Publikumspreis abzustimmen. Die Preisstifter sind wie jedes Jahr BR und Dreisat. Ähm, auf unserer Homepage erfahren Sie mehr zum Abstimmungsprozess. Äh, und hiermit bedanke ich mich nochmal bei Luciana Kaplan. Muchas gracias y muy buenas tardes.